Hello and welcome to Grace. Have you ever been to some social function, perhaps a wedding reception, a graduation party, or even an anniversary meal, or something at least, where all the guests didn't quite click together? I think we've all been at some function where some of the people don't quite fit in. And there are reasons. Maybe there has been a divorce and a former spouse is there with their family in this uh, event, or there's been a fallout and there's some kind of awkward conversation going on. And perhaps even a young couple is engaged at a graduation party and one of the couple is from a well-to-do home while the other is considered to be from the wrong side of town. And the two families just don't mingle well. In our passage this morning, we come to a similar situation as what we'd find on one of these. And I've labeled this awkward occasion, sinners are welcome. For that is true, and that really is what it is. This occasion is when a man named Levi, as he's called here in our passage, determines to introduce his friends and contemporaries to Christ around a festive meal. And so that's where we are in our, our expository journey through the Gospel of Mark. This section we're about to read, and we've read already in the beginning of chapter 2, is all about forgiveness that leads into discipleship and what salvation means played out. And so this is set in contrast to the attitudes of the so-called religious leaders of that day. So following ministry around the region of Galilee, Jesus returns to Capernaum. And his return really creates quite a stir as the multitudes arrive at Peter's house, hoping to see Jesus. And we read last week about the palsied man who was miraculously healed, and Jesus made the statement that caught the attention of the scribes there. He said, child, your sins are forgiven. And Jesus had power unlike anything they had ever encountered before. Uh, but the scribes and the Pharisees became very skeptical of Jesus very quickly, and they accused him of blasphemy, as we saw in the last passage. And from that moment on, they closely scrutinized everything Jesus says. So this next clash between Jesus and the religious leaders re uh, revolves around the company that he kept. Uh, not only had Jesus not separated himself from shady characters, uh, he actually seeks them out. So let's go ahead and begin reading in Mark chapter 2, starting in verse 13 and going to verse 17. It says in verse 13, He went out again beside the sea, and all the crowd was coming to him, and he was teaching them. And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, Follow me. And he rose, and he followed him. And as reclined at the table in his house, many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. Verse 16, And the scribes of the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, said to his disciples, Why does he, or why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And then finally, I want to stop here at verse 17 where Jesus responds. He says, And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Jesus here is charged with befriending sinners. And this charge is actually true. These accusations are true. Just as Jesus entered the world to save sinners, he still enters sinful human lives to rescue those he loves. But in this morning's passage, there's this reversal that goes on. Those who think that they are healthy prove themselves to be sick. And those who know that they are sick find health. So what do you claim to be? I want to go step by step through this reversal of this ancient proverb that Jesus is uh, coming off of, where the ill need a physician to better understand what Jesus is doing here. So for our outline this morning, the first point that I want to make is this call of a sinner. We saw with last week that Jesus had been in uh, Percur uh, Capernaum, rather, uh, the northwest shore of the Sea of Galilee. Again, he was there to begin his ministry. He left to go to the rural towns, and he's back there again, and he was at Peter's house. 
and people start running to him again in Capernaum. That's what verse 13 tells us. It says he went out again beside the sea, and all the crowds was coming to him. Jesus' great popularity with the crowds continues. And it's this meaningful contrast to the growing rejection from the leaders there. And so these two groups, the crowds that follow and the leaders who reject them, they become very polar opposites as the people are flocking after Jesus. And at the same time, these leaders begin to oppose them more and more. That creates this, this tension. It's a wonderful literary tension, but it's not just for literary uh, doings. This is reality. And so it says he began to teach them. When these crowds follow him along the Sea of Galilee, he begins to teach them. The idea here, this began to teach, it, it's uh, imperative, which means it's a continual action, kept teaching. He kept on teaching. He didn't stop. And we know from chapter 1 already, especially in verse 14, that he was proclaiming the gospel of God. That's what he was teaching. And he says things like, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe. That's what he was teaching. Believe the gospel, the good news. In the midst of all these people, Jesus notices one person. He sees Levi. He's passing by. He saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus. And there is some debate out there to who is Levi. We don't hear much about him in the other Gospels, if any at all, or maybe we do. Mark here tells us that he was son of Alphaeus. And when we look at the 12 disciples, there is one that's called James, the son of Alphaeus. And we actually find that later on in chapter 3 in the book of Mark here at verse 18. There's James, the son of Alphaeus. And also in the same account here that we're reading about, but in Matthew's account, Matthew chapter 9, verse 9 to be exact, there's a man there named Matthew. He's one of the 12, and he's Matthew the tax collector. And so many get from the traditional view that this Levi that we read about in Mark is the same Matthew that we read in the Gospel of Matthew, and that Matthew and Levi, uh, similar to the idea of Paul Saul or Simon Peter or John Mark, uh, this is two names, two Jewish names, which would be pretty interesting since a lot of them are their Roman name and their Jew name, but... Uh, they had two Jewish names for Levi, Matthew. But also, Levi could be a brother of James and Matthew, so it's kind of hard to argue that. But just to let you know that uh, likely this is the same Matthew talked about in Matthew chapter 9, the tax collector. But what is he doing? Okay, we kind of know a little bit about who he might be, but what is he doing? Well, he's sitting at this tax booth. Levi had this special seat at the customs booth, if you will, outside of Capernaum, and he collected these indirect taxes. These are tariffs on commercial goods, and they were being transported from the sea to the land routes. And this was for Herod Antipas. He worked for him. And the tax collection booths, they were elevated platforms or benches. So everyone would have been able to see Levi, and everyone probably knew Levi as they passed through the city. Uh, they had to pay taxes to him, so they had to be able to find him pretty easily, and he had to be able to see who was coming in and going out. And this is probably not the first time, actually, then Jesus saw Levi, since he had gone in and out, and he'd walked these shores at least a few times already in the book of Mark. So such people like Levi, they're obviously despised because they consorted with the Romans, and they were allowed to, by the Roman government, to add whatever surcharge that they felt necessary, which, uh, of course, meant that uh, it was a, usually an exorbitant amount that nobody should have uh, been uh, made to pay. Tax collectors were expected to take a commission on the taxes that they collected. That was expected, but most of them overcharged and, of course, kept it just as profits. Thus, the tax collectors were hated by most Jews because of their reputation for cheating and because of their support of Rome. A Jew who accepted such an office as this or a job as a tax collector was excommunicated from the synagogue, and he was shamed, and his family and friends shamed him. Thus, a Jewish tax collector was looked down very much upon uh, for valuing money over reputation and respectability and purity before God and concern for his own people who had to pay the extreme high taxes in the first place to the imperial power. 
And so according to Jewish tradition, actually, a tax collector would then render a home unclean just by entering into a home. And because of the tax collector's greeds and the collusion with the enemies, the, the Roman Empire, the enemies of the Jews, Levi seems like he's a very poor choice for a disciple of Jesus. But Jesus, and even God the Father, specializes in making the weak become strong and the outcasts of society as accepted by him. None of these disciples were worthy candidates, none of them. But just as Paul says later on, he says, I'll boast of the things that show my weakness. This is 2 Corinthians 11 here, verse 30. It is, or if it is necessary to boast, I'll boast about the things related to my weakness. Why? Well, because God's power is made perfect in weakness. Again, this is uh, the Apostle Paul talking in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, where he says, my grace, this is Jesus' words to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you because the power is perfected in weakness. Therefore, I will boast most gladly in my weakness. Why? In order that the power of Christ might reside in me. This is why a man like Levi, a man like me, and even a person like you can have hope that we too can forsake our past. We can repent, and with our weaknesses still, we can follow after Jesus. This passage is hope. And in fact, look at this. Back in verse 14 of Mark chapter 2, he said to him, follow me. And he stood up and followed him. The brevity of Jesus' call to this, uh, this tax collector and Levi's radical obedience immediately. Jesus' two words, follow me, they're in the imperative mood, which uh, is a command. Uh, other translations might say, come, be my disciple, follow me. Uh, this meaning being a command, it's not an invitation. And Levi recognizes that. And Jesus wasn't inviting him. Jesus was calling him. So Levi got up and he followed. Levi's radical obedience is amazing, especially because of the radical change it really would have had on his life. He's already ostracized by his family and friends. So following Jesus probably didn't make a difference in that regard. But Levi, probably very wealthy tax collecting, it was a lucrative occupation. Levi had to have been an outcast, but now he was a wanted member of a specific small group. But he would have had to learn a, a life, to live a life with much less to gain so much more. And so now we get to the concern of a sinner. Levi responded, just as Jesus would have wanted all his followers to do, immediate obedience. He followed his Lord immediately, and he called his friends together to meet him too. He was excited about this. He held this dinner for, uh, with his fellow tax collectors and many other notorious sinners so they could all meet this Jesus who has called them. So now in Levi's house, there gathered this crowd that Jesus wouldn't have been able probably to reach in any other way through the synagogues. So now he takes his teaching not from the synagogues and from the, the side of the sea into Levi's house with Levi's friends. So verse 15, it happened that he was dining in his house and many tax collectors and sinners were dining with Jesus. This is a crowd he wouldn't have otherwise reached. Uh, and his disciples, for there were many, and they were following him. These tax collectors had been excommunicated, as I mentioned earlier, from the synagogues. And the term here for sinners, it could refer to the common people who were not learned in the law and did not abide by the rigid standards that the Pharisees upheld. The Pharisees regarded these people as wicked and opposed to the will of God because they did not observe the rituals for purity, which enabled them to eat with others. In any case, Jesus had attracted this following among these kinds of people. And these people were now at Levi's house where they knew they were welcomed. And they too got to sit with Jesus and 
Jesus' disciples at dinner, and they listened to the message from this marvelous teacher and what he had to say to this group of people. So Jesus really is aligning himself by doing this with despised sinners, and this is exactly what the scribes are seeing. Verse 16, the scribes of the Pharisees, of the Pharisees uh, when they saw that he was eating with these sinners, with sinners, Again, he could be saying sinners in a general reference to common people who didn't follow the laws like they did. But most likely, this refers to the socially uh, disreputable and flagrant sinners, what we think of petty criminals, prostitutes, gamblers, and in the Jewish mindset, Gentiles. This is the world. This is the defining characteristic of Jesus Jesus is not of the world, but he is in the world. He is not a part of the world, but he's around the world. And he's sharing this table of fellowship with those who the rest of society had rejected. Most scribes were indeed of the Pharisaic tradition, and they would have been highly offended that Jesus shares his meal with these people. The Pharisaic scribes, their job was not only to uh, write out the scriptures, but actually teach the scripture and the law and to protect uh, them from against anyone's willful defiance of it. And they saw themselves as righteous and above everyone else who were sinners. And so everything about this scene that Jesus is in right now is wrong to them. The food was not cooked properly. It was not kosher. The setting was not according to their protocol that they had set up. And the scene and the people being impure or unclean would have not been allowed. And so right here, the scribes of the Pharisees, this is actually the first uh, mention we get to of the Pharisaic group in the Gospel of Mark. Uh, they developed from the pious ones uh, that we find in the Maccabean uh, period. If you were to read First and Second Maccabees, which is not part of the canon of Scripture, but nonetheless still uh, historical, you'll find that they were strong Orthodox Jews who developed this oral tradition and became the official interpreters of the Torah in their day. And so they came from pious ones to Pharisees. And uh, they were obsessed with the adherence to the purity laws, the Sabbath observance and ritual regulations in general they're probably somewhat control freaks because not only did they want you to follow god's law they wanted you to follow their law perfectly and you can't blame them too much they tried to build a fence if you will around the law to help the common people uh, follow its stipulations so they thought they were helping by adding on these man's uh, man-made traditions to help you not come close to disobeying god's law but then they had you follow those traditions as if they were God's law. But they were highly influential in the first century, and they were looked up to, and they shunned contact, and especially sharing meals with such sinners as these to avoid this look of impurity. And it's amazing how much pride these Pharisees have. Uh, one good illustration of this is this TV show you might be familiar with, The Office. Now, I'm not necessarily recommending you go out and watch The Office. I'm not advertising the office here but uh, there's a good uh illustration of pride here in a specific episode i think it's from the third season of this popular series michael scott the character on there played by steve carell he's being interviewed for a position at the dunder milfin uh corporation headquarters in new york city in this episode and the interview presents this humorous picture of human pride this interviewer says to this character, Michael Scott, he says, so let me ask you a question right off the bat. What do you think are your greatest strengths as a manager? Well, then Steve Carell played, uh, playing Michael Scott responds. He says, why don't I tell you what my greatest weaknesses are? I work too hard. I care too much. And sometimes I could be too invested in my job. And the interviewer goes, okay, that's your weaknesses. Let me hear your strengths. And then the character, Michael Scott, he responds back, well, my weaknesses are actually my strengths. Well, needless to say, in this episode, Michael was not hired for that position. And sadly, I think many of us are like this character, Michael Scott. 
and perhaps even like the Pharisees that we find in Mark chapter 2. We are unwilling to see our weakness. We are unwilling to see our failures, our own sin, and our own personal need for Jesus. It's easy to look at somebody else and point the finger and say, I see what's wrong with them. But it seems so hard to point the finger back and say, I see what's wrong with me. We are unwilling, usually, to even do such a thing. And so we must be aware and beware of the pride that makes us blind to our own sickness and our own need of a Savior. These Pharisees didn't need Jesus, so they thought they were already righteous enough. And so when Jesus came down, uh, came down and sat down with a meal with these scum that the Pharisees saw, these Pharisees were quite surprised. Here is a man who had seemed to have the entire law almost at his fingertips, who taught with this great authority, yet who did this, who stooped down so low to the level of the poor, the unlearned, the common people, and even sinners. And so these Pharisees, they pull his disciples aside and say, what in the world is going on? Why is Jesus doing this? And so we see this conversion of Levi as the really the, the pinnacle answer to what Jesus gives them. This question that they ask, why is he doing this? This question apparently made it to its way to Jesus' ears. And Jesus had an answer for these self-righteous, influential leaders of the day. It says, when Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who are healthy do not have a need of a physician, but those who are sick have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. I think it's easy as a church today to come and sit here and be like, well, I'm here every Sunday. I don't do these big sins like adultery and drunkenness and drugs. And, you know, you go down the list and you're, you're checking them off and you're, you're like, what? I'm good. I'm righteous before my God. So usually these churchgoers, these faithful churchgoers might be very faithful in coming but they struggle with sin. They're still in their sin-cursed flesh, living on the sin-cursed earth. But when those little white lies and those smaller sins, those, as Jerry Bridges would call, respectable sins come out, oh, I don't have that. That's not my problem. You're the one with the problem. Well, I don't need a physician. Now, they wouldn't say this, but in their hearts, they're almost saying, I don't need Jesus. I'm already perfect enough. And it's sad. People who are well do not seek out a physician. The physician's waiting room is filled with people who are sick. They recognize their need and they come to the one who can make them well, who they trust. And really this goes back to the forgiveness of that paralytic last week that we read about. And it shows the salvation is really the message, the central message of this whole first section of Mark. And Jesus applies this proverb of the ill to the sphere of this spiritual healing. Those who know that they are sickly sinners rather than those who think themselves to be healthy and righteous. So he has a call. This call, those who are healthy do not have a need of physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. He's called the sinners. What is this call? His call is really a call to God's salvation and to his discipleship. The self-righteous are not coming to his kingdom. So Jesus is spending his time with those who are open and they will accept his healing presence. And so Jesus did not come to call those who think they are already good enough. And he used ironically here those like these Pharisees who thought they were so righteous, repentance wasn't a part of their theology. They didn't have anything to repent from, but that's what Jesus is teaching, repentance. That's what um, John the Baptist was saying from the beginning. In chapter 1, verse 4, John the Baptist, repentance and forgiveness. And so the self-righteous did not recognize their sinfulness, nor did they agree that they were desperate before a most holy God. But these sinners sure saw their need. And this was Jesus' audience. And the importance 
really of this is what we are doing with our ministries. A ministry to the outcasts of society. There's a true story of a certain pastor at a particular church. He tells that of a Sunday morning when his sermon's theme was on God's love and grace for all people. And present on that day was a young couple who looked like they were probably homeless. They smelled. They didn't, had dirty clothes on. And they sat directly in front of an elderly couple who was always dressed in their Sunday best. And during the congregational greeting time, this elderly couple not only greeted the young couple, these perhaps homeless couple, very warmly, but they also introduced them to other people, much like actually we do here at Grace Baptist Church. And the warmth and the kindness of this congregation to these visitors who were seemingly perhaps outcast in other areas of life, it continued after the service concluded. And before they left, this young couple said to the pastor, we've been to a few churches in the past few weeks, but this is the first time we've really felt welcomed in one of these churches. And they say, we'll be back. Well, on this particular morning, the church not only preached a message about the grace of God for the outcast, it lived out the message. And the pastor did not see the couple for the next Sunday. He was hoping to see them again, and they were gone. But he did receive a call from the woman's mother of this young couple asking him to visit her daughter who was in the hospital. In a few days after the church service that they missed, this young woman had ended up in the hospital, and 10 days later, she died. In the last few days of her life, this woman had experienced God's grace through a loving congregation, and they got to hear the message of salvation. What a wonderful thing to be able to be a part of, where God uses us. And we must be a church that welcomes those who are different, who are struggling, and who are outcasts. I can recall people saying, well, you don't want too many of those kinds of people in a church. You want church to be comfortable. No. Jesus didn't call us to be comfortable. He called us to be loving and be known by our love. And he had a heart for those, especially who were rejected and unloved by many other people. And it is amazing to see what God can do when we extend his grace to those who are helpless. Our reward is in heaven. We get to the end of the sermon and we say, so what? This passage proves that our prejudice has no place in God's kingdom. And Jesus demonstrates that by centering on these kinds of people, the outcast in society, and showing the divine acceptance of all who come to him in faith. And the only requirement for salvation is a belief that causes genuine repentance and that becomes possible when the self-righteous people humble themselves before God and open their hearts before Jesus. And there's no place for a ministry that favors one segment of society over another. And there's no path to God except that through faith. Faith and belief. Actually, in the Greek, it's the same word, pistis, pisteo, to have faith. Pistis is the noun form, and pisteo is the verb form, I believe, or to believe. But there's three things I want us to walk away with uh, before we leave here this morning. One is salvation is for all. Salvation is not limited to a certain group of people. It doesn't mean that everyone will be saved, but the salvation offer is to every single human being. And there's a special place in God's heart for those, especially in society, who society is rejected. God does not seem to favor the elite in this world. He came for all. Christ came and died for all. And not just for rich or powerful or those that seem to have it all together. And this is seen clearly in Jesus' choice, not only of Levi, but all the 12 apostles. None from the upper class of society. 
And several, like here in our passage with Levi, that is especially despised by their own fellow Jews. Jesus shares meals with sinners. He's in the world. He's not in a bubble, but he's not of the world. And it means that he's completely accepted sinners when there's no sin found in him. And he refused to observe the boundaries which these Jewish leaders demanded about of people to be right before God. And he didn't separate himself from this, the, this crowd, these disreputable people. And I think if Jesus were here today, he would center still on the poor and the marginalized. It's funny, we have this movement now where the marginalized are lifted uh, above in our society, uh, the majority. Now, sadly, with social justice out there, it is not biblical. It is not right. It's not love. It's a quest for power, for control, and for importance. But here we have what is truly biblical, where we are to love the marginalized and accept them. This is biblical justice and love. So, the call of Levi that we see here must involve benevolence, love. And the church, including the elders, including the deacons and the pastors, the leaders, must embrace all social classes, not the ones that they think are going to contribute to the most to the church financially. No, it is everybody. And even uh, James, later on in the New Testament, James chapter 1 tells it well when he says that the poor should take pride in their high position in the Lord. Their high position in the Lord, that's what the poor should take pride in. And the rich should take pride in their humiliation before the Lord. And so salvation is for all. But secondly, a choice must be made between faith and salvation as opposed to this opposition and rejection of these leaders. This passage does not teach universalism that everyone will be saved, but this choice has to be made. And it doesn't teach also that disease and infirmities are the result of sin. And certainly as the men's Bible study have been going through the book of Job, it proves that's true. Suffering at times can be the result of sin. Certainly death and disease entered the world through sin. We know this. But often, and maybe more times than not, there are greater issues at stake. Both James and Peter in 1 Peter teach that the purpose of trials is to increase our faith and to teach us endurance, not to punish us, although some uh, trials is punishment from our sin. I'm not going to discount that completely, but the issue here is teaching us endurance. And every person must choose between faith or self in opposition to the rest of the world or the rest of anything. The paralytic from last week and his friends, they chose the path of faith and experienced both forgiveness and a healthy body, spiritually, as well as physically. Whereas the scribes here in our passage this morning chose the path of rejection and forfeited salvation in Christ. And God expects the kind of bold faith that was shown by those friends from last week's passage and the results are more than worth the price. You can lose God's blessings by taking a false religious stance that leads away from the power of Jesus to heal and forgive. And then third, so what I want to end with this morning, is that God not only sees the sin in us, but he also sees the potential for good in each of us. No one out of human wisdom would have ever thought that Jesus would ever choose a disciple of one of the twelve, these super saints, from among the tax collectors. Since they were among the most notorious sinners imaginable. And how dare us think that we need to uh, make people that come into the church with their pants half down, uh, with looking junky or whatever they might look like, 
How dare we try to stop them from being part of God's chosen people? This has happened numerous times in the church's history. And then not to mention that God would choose somebody who seems hopeless as God's great leaders. They've often come, they've been converted from lives of depravity. You could just look at Augustine, St. Augustine, or Billy Sunday's life before he came to Christ. We must realize that each one of us is made in the image of God. And thus he has placed us and in us. Seeds of this greatness that he put there through Jesus' work that can produce this harvest of incredible results if we simply surrender completely to Christ and allow the Spirit to guide our lives. And so, in conclusion, every person must choose between faith and salvation, or faith or salvation, whatever you want to call it, choose between salvation and and opposition. Which one will you choose? Are you going to oppose the one who came for you? Or are you going to embrace him? Salvation is for everyone, but not everyone chooses to be saved. Jesus gives special priority to the social outcasts and sinners. There's a special measure of grace for them. And Jesus sees the potential in every person. And so should we. After all, Jesus can call anyone, including you, to his service. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this time. I thank you for the scripture being a beacon of hope in such a dark world. And that there's not just hope for the elite. There's not just hope for those who are white-collared or even blue-collared. There's hope for all amazing power of the gospel to change the lives of even those who are the most sinful. Even me. Lord, I love you. Truly, the gospel brings a hope that nothing else can. Nothing else can even compare to. It is founded in the work of Jesus the Christ on the cross. Lord, we love you. We praise you. And I pray that we would remain faithful to this gospel, faithful for the, to the proclamation, just as those friends of that paralytic man would do anything to bring others to Christ. Let that be true for Grace Baptist Church. Lord, we love you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you for joining us this morning. If you're listening in online, let me know if you prayed that prayer or if you need Christ. Or if you're here this morning, uh, stop me before I leave. Or stop one of the deacons or the leadership here at Grace. And we'd be more than willing to pray with you. If you're at home right now, you can chime in with in the comments. Or you can call us at 906-771-5851. And if this has been a blessing to you, let us know. You can let us know by reaching out to us. Or you can uh, give. If you're here in, uh, in the sanctuary right now, there's offering boxes in the back. Or if you're online and you would like to give, there's a couple ways. You can go to our website at gracekingsford.org and click on the Give button at the front page or slash give. Or uh, you can give by text message as well, which you'll see the slides at the end of the service or at the beginning of the service uh, with a number there. Thank you for joining us. God bless.